A very warm welcome to you. If you've been here for a few days, uh, I hope you have found it uh, an inspirational program. I hope you've had the chance uh, to meet colleagues from right around the world. If you're coming in today for the Practitioners uh, Forum, uh, then you will see why the faces around you are kind of tired but happy because we've been here for a few days. But you are welcome. This is the UK... Uh, Practitioners Forum. This is an event that we organise uh, uh, every year, uh, and this year it is part of the wider Cooperatives uh, United uh, programme. Uh, the Practitioners Forum is going to focus on a number of uh, strands, uh, and those are the Secretaries Forum, uh, the Accountants Forum, uh, and I'd want to recognise Professor John Arnold uh, at the back, who is Chair of the Cooperatives UK Cooperative Performance uh, Committee. Um, the Accountants Forum, the Communications, which is the first time we have uh, run this, and then the People and Performance uh, Forum. So those are the four strands that we're going to be running uh, over today. Now, there was a sign outside a small uh, worker cooperative uh, some years ago that read, Liberty, Equality, and Boot Repairs. This is the boot repairs bit. Uh, and so this is about practical skills. It's about the sharing of experience uh, about uh, running a cooperative uh, um, from a practitioner's uh, point of view. Now, I'd like to say some things which are kind of pretty bloody obvious, uh, which is that there is no evacuation planned. So if there is a fire alarm, please uh, evacuate. Um, Mobile phones are, are, are kind of beautiful, switched off or uh, vibrate. Um, and that is all of the... Oh, no, I should say, sorry, uh, you use the stairwell to go down in terms of the evacuation. Again, pretty bloody obvious if there's an evacuation, use the stairs. We are on the first floor, uh, but it does say here in my notes to tell you that. Now, it's great pleasure to um, uh, introduce our keynote speaker to launch the Practitioner Forum, uh, who is Martin Lowry. Uh, Martin is a, a cooperative leader uh, from the States, uh, leads the uh, NREC, which is the uh, National Rural Electricity uh, Cooperatives Association. He's on the board of the, uh, the National Cooperative Business Association, our sister organisation uh, in uh, the United States. Uh, he has been closely involved in the activities around the international year, uh, including with uh, an event in Ireland on rural cooperatives uh, last uh, month with the chair of Cooperatives UK, uh, David, David Button. So I'm going to pass over now to uh, Martin Lowry for a keynote speaker and a warm, warm welcome to you uh, for this uh, 2012 Practitioners Conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I really appreciate being here. I appreciate the invitation, Ed, and the work that Cooperatives UK has done to put this together, uh, along with uh, the Cooperative Group and, and the ICA. Um, I was particularly interested in coming here for personal reasons, because uh, in 1964, at the age of 16 years old, I turned on the Ed Sullivan Show, along with uh, 17 million other people in the United States, and uh, saw the Beatles for the first time, and uh, changed my uh, musical direction entirely. I had been playing guitar since I was 12 years old, and still do, uh, along with keyboards, have a, have a band that does mostly rock and roll, and uh, country and blues. And so I went to Liverpool, and my younger daughter was wondering whether I was going to kiss the ground when I arrived. I did not do that, um, but it was, a, it was a great experience. And then when I came back to Manchester, I did a little tour around and, and went to Manchester Cathedral. And uh, I happened to walk into the cathedral where there was a, a chorale of young people uh, practicing and uh, sat down and listened to the beautiful harmonies that they were able to produce and kind of made a connection in my own mind about the incredible importance of music and the incredible power of music. And it's part of what I'd like to talk about this morning uh, as it relates by analogy to the incredible power of cooperatives and cooperation. And I'll start with two points about music. The first is that, as we all know, music is a universal language. Uh, it probably is the only universal language. We tried Esperanto uh, many years ago. That never got off the ground. But when you watch people like we did uh, the other night at the awards ceremony uh, from all cultures uh, standing up to dance to Angel Square, 
uh, you, see, you see something really interesting and important that's, that's going on there. And I want to connect that a little bit to um, the conferences that came before us, since Manchester is really the closure of discussions through the whole year on international cooperatives. Uh, and that would be the conference that we had uh, in Ireland uh, at Dunsany Castle involving rural development. And then the conference that took place in Quebec City, or Quebec City a couple of, years, uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, on more of the economic model around cooperatives. And thinking first of, of music as a universal language, one of the things that interestingly came out of Quebec was the fact that we may not have worked hard enough on our own language. That is, the language that describes what the cooperative model is about and how it works. And, and what that really is about is that we borrow from the free market enterprise and entrepreneurial capitalist model for some of our language in terms of profits and, and, and margins and uh, even to the point of, of, of types of performance, how we measure performance. And there were quite a few economists um, on those panels who said that is probably not the right way to go. And what that refers to is this idea called isomorphism, that you try to get closer and closer to a view that there is a single view of what a corporation is. And then the cooperative kinds of spins off its own interpretation of that. And they were warning us not to go that way, to come up with a vocabulary that does indeed express the uniqueness of the cooperative model. And I think it's a great challenge for us in the, in the coming years. And as we've now declared the international decade of cooperatives, that's on the to-do list, to begin to think about the fact that we have to have a language that describes the uniqueness of who we are, and not simply that we're kind of an appendage on the, on the primary model that is somehow going to drive us to prosperity in the future, which in this conference many people have talked about as folly, that we've got to begin to look at, at ways to look differently at how we have economic recovery and sustainability of that recovery over the long term. The second thing I'd say about uh, music is a, is a very interesting um, aspect of music that involves the performance of music and listening to music. And it comes from an individual who was originally a recording engineer in the late 60s in San Francisco who worked with the Jefferson Airplane and the Grateful Dead and all those groups that were in the summer of love when the Beatles were kind of finishing their, uh, their uh, career uh, and getting toward the Abbey Road album. And uh, he wrote a book called This Is Your Brain on Music. And he wrote it as a neurophysiologist, not as a recording engineer. In doing the recording work, he, he got very interested in the nature of how, are, how do we respond to music? What's that all about? And as a neurophysiologist, he specialized in this. And what he has concluded is that more aspects of the brain uh, are functioning actively when listening to music than in most other experiences that human beings have. And most interestingly, that when you're performing music, as my friend Russ Wasson from the U.S., who works on tax finance and accounting issues, of all things, as a bass, bass player and musician, you're using virtually every aspect of the brain. Uh, right, left, emotional, logical, and so on. And the analogy I would, I would make there in terms of, of cooperatives, and this came out in uh, the Dunsany meetings in Ireland as well as in Quebec, is that the way we, we look at our experience historically and the way we look at uh, where we are today as cooperatives actually has to be, let's call it a whole brain experience. And, and it's not just about law or accounting or economics. It includes psychology. It includes sociology. It includes history. It includes political science. Um, basically, all the disciplines that any university would be looking at. I, I would argue, as, as having a background in philosophy, that it includes philosophy, too, and that there is a philosophical framework within which we talk about not only the history of the cooperative model, but where we are today as, as cooperatives. And so as we move forward in this, in this decade, I would hope that we see an interdisciplinary approach. It does exist today. It exists in, in Europe. It exists in Canada, uh, where you find people from multiple disciplines being interested in exploring the model, in researching reasons why it works. And that interdisciplinary approach is, in fact, analogous to the whole human being experience uh, coming to play when we talk about why the model is important. So with that little bit of a background in, in terms of where we're likely to go in the next 10 years on exploring the, the huge potential that we have, 
as cooperators, I'd like to talk a little bit to, from a practitioner point of view. I'm an employee as well as a director, as Ed said. Um, many of you are both employees and managers, managers of, of uh, your entire organizations or portions of your organizations. Some of you serve as trustees on, on boards, all within the cooperative model. And the, the question really in this is, what motivates us to continue to do what we do? You know, we refer sometimes to the investor-owned world as the dark side. You know, what motivates us not to go to the dark side? Or what motivates us to come away from that side? And, and as happens often in my sector in the United States, within the electric utility business, people who had worked for years and years in an investor-owned for-profit world say they've basically died and gone to heaven that, that they, they love the fact that they've come to work within a cooperative environment. And I'm sure many of you would share that experience, that um, you're happy with the career that you have uh, chosen. Um, maybe some of you have actually worked in a for-profit environment and are now in a cooperative environment, or certainly associate in terms of partnerships and alliances with the for-profit world. Uh, I had a conversation as recently as yesterday evening with some folks um, who are involved in uh, foster care. Uh, cooperative activities in the UK. And we came to this same point, which is there's a, there's a collegiality, there's a very interesting difference in terms of how we associate with one another within the cooperative movement globally. And it seems to be a fairly consistent pattern ar around uh, the world. So what is it that motivates us to continue to believe that this is the right career, this is where we want to retire, and even after retirement, this is where we want to continue to associate ourselves? Is it simply the goals, the, the idea that this is, there's a social commitment or a social value, I think not because there's, we've got day-to-day -day work to do. And on the day-to-day -day work that many of you in the room do, um, you don't particularly associate it with a, a, a philosophical excitement about changing the world. It's, it's really much more, I'm here and I've got work to do and I've got to get, so, so what is it about it that motivates us to do that? And I'm going to talk to you a little bit now about the idea of optimal motivation. And there's, there's three words that are involved in optimal motivation. And you can remember it with the uh, acronym ARC, ARC. And it is autonomy, relatedness, and competency. So the autonomy piece is about the idea that all of us as human beings want to have the perception that we have choice, that we're not locked in or straitjacketed to being told that this is where you're going, you know, there's point B, you're at point A, go there and we'll be happy. The idea that there's a certain amount of autonomy that we have in the choices that we make, and that includes the choices we make as employees, as managers, as trustees, as boards of directors, uh, even within the larger collective world of cooperation among cooperatives. Then the second one, the R, is relatedness. All of us want to be cared about cared for, and all of us want to care about others. I think there's an interesting relationship there in that, that very fact, the relatedness we have as human beings, with the idea that reciprocity is a fundamental aspect of how cooperatives operate. That I may not gain initially in my contribution to you or helping you with something, but at some point you're going to, uh, um, you're going to return that gift or that favor. There's a reciprocity relationship there. And the relatedness idea that human beings have, that we care about other people and we want to be cared about, is part of what optimal motivation is. And then competence is the third. The, the idea that we want to be skilled and capable of delivering results. I'm sure every one of us at some point in time has had the worry or the angst or the frustration to say, I'm not sure I can do what I was asked to do because I'm not sure I know what it is that would, would allow me to get that done successfully on time within budget or whatever. And the idea that competence is something we all, we all strive for. We want to be competent at what we do. If we're looking to be upwardly mobile in an organization or do something different, we know we need to have the skill set to do that. And that's really about education, continuing education, lifetime education. So you've got these three aspects of what researchers would argue is optimal motivation. You, you've got the idea that we need to have choice or believe we have choice and that we've got some freedom, free will. We've got the, the piece about relating to one another and, and feeling that we're cared for and we care about people. 
and then that we're competent and we've got the skill set capable to do the job. What does that have to do with cooperatives and the uniqueness of what motivates us as cooperators or as being part of a cooperative institution or environment? This is speculation, and I think research might bear it out, should bear it out. There's a difference between intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation, being, being motivated from your own internal environment to, to move ahead on things, and then something external to you. And so if we contrast the world that we live in every day with the investor-owned world, there is clearly an extrinsic motivation on the investor-owned side, and that's profit and return on that profitability, return to the individual, return to the corporation. That extrinsic motivation, if taken to its ultimate, is the problem. The problem of greed, the problem of excess, because it's out there and you're striving for it, you're reaching for it, and you expect to get a significant return or reward from that extrinsic motivation. Intrinsically, however, if you look at the optimal motivation model that we just talked about, about autonomy, relatedness, and competence, we can identify those three elements with the cooperative principles, with principles four, five, and six. We can identify principle four as autonomy and independence. We do not lock ourselves into a specific relationship that does not give us optionality. We keep our options open on behalf of the members that we serve. We have the principle of education, training, and information, which fits exactly with competencies and the need for consistent skill building around the skill sets, the capacities we know we need as practitioners to get the job done. And then finally, we have cooperation among cooperatives, which really is the sense of relatedness that we relate to one another. There has been a great deal of conversation at the Dunsany meetings in Ireland, in Quebec, and here, about the fact that we need to spend much more time on that principle of cooperation among cooperatives. That if we lock ourselves into our sector, or our country, or the specific issues we face within our own institution, we lose significant opportunity for sharing a lot of different things that can result in greater performance, higher performance overall. And a lot of reminders in these meetings about the desirability of not simply going back to where we were within our own institutions, but instead remaining connected and recognizing that there are opportunities out of that connectivity to do better than we otherwise would have done. I had a conversation with Ed, for example, just before uh, we started this morning about the question of governance excellence within cooperatives individually and globally. And I think we all share the same concern that the Achilles heel of the cooperative model is ineffective governance. It's not ineffectiveness of employees or an inability to get training or to have the absolute optimal performance. It really is more the failure that can occur if a board of directors does not understand its unique responsibility both to its membership and to the people that it oversees. Does not understand fully the separation between management and governance. Uh, we see that all over the world. And the, the, the ability to, to stay the course on that, you could do within your own individual cooperative. You could do it within your own sector. You could do it through a national program. But frankly, I think there are opportunities that we see out of the International Year of Cooperatives to do this at the level of, of leading practices globally and try to find commonality. I know there will be discussions here actually today on how that works within the world of accounting, John and, and, and Russ, and the question of standardization of, of accounting practices and con conflict that occurs there or commonality that occurs there. Uh, the very same thing can be done at the level of governance. So the idea that the four cooperative or the three cooperative principles that I mentioned, principles four, five, and six, directly relate to that idea of being intrinsically motivated and hence optimally motivated, I think could be proven through some additional field research to be the reason that we find ourselves happy as employees of cooperatives, happy and challenged, um, coming to work believing that we've made a difference, that it's, that it's literally coming from the intrinsic motivation that comes from the way we think about our work as driven by the cooperative principles. 
But I also want to take another step in this conversation, that the principles are talked about all the time. Um, they were recodified with the addition of Principle 7 of Commitment to Community here in Manchester in 1995, and they're used around the world. I would say, for the most part, they represent our organizational framework. Uh, some of you probably went to the movie last night, the, the premiere showing of the Rochdale Pioneers. And much of that is about the idea that you had to conclude that there were specific principles within which you were going to open that, that grocery. <laughs> but we couldn't understand all the accents. That's right. That was interesting. We'll have to work on that. I'll have to work on that or the rest of us will. Subtitle, right, right. <laughs> but I got enough of it to recognize that the, 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 the idea of being able to write down those principles was going to be the difference between simply having a grocery store or, or not. And they had to do with we won't take credit, we only take cash, we will, we will offer dividends, the dividends are going to be an important part, they have to be accounted for very clearly, and, and so on. Um, all of that is very important. But I will argue to you that when we get to the point of why we are motivated to work for cooperatives, it's the values and how those values actually apply more directly to the human experience. And they are underutilized and need to be much more broadly publicized. And those values were codified in 1995 as well here in Manchester. And it's self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equity, equality, and solidarity. Now think of the economic crisis that's faced in the UK, that's faced in Europe, that's faced in the United States, uh, and the potential that we're not out of the woods by any means yet, and that there are still really large issues to address um, before we see economic recovery and stability. And, and think about the number of people globally and it's said all the time now, who are in a state of distrust of all institutions. And they don't know where to turn. And this came out very clearly in the film last night. Um, if you don't know who to trust, trust yourself. Uh, it was quite interesting that the, what, what the, the whole direction of the Rochdale Pioneers story is to say we can trust ourselves. And, you know, there are good guys and bad guys there, the, the wholesalers who are saying, I'm just not going to supply them. We're going to squeeze them. If we, if we don't allow wholesale supply, they can't do retail. So let's, let's squeeze this and, and see how long they can last on the money that was contributed by the individual contributors. Um, you had the question of quality as well, and, and a great piece of the story of the, um, of the uh, uh, flour, and not the flour, the um, chalk being put into uh, the oatmeal. Now, when you're over at Rochdale, the story is that the chalk was put into flour, and that makes some sense. Anyway, in the movie, it was put in the oatmeal, and one of the pioneers uh, catches the guy and says, give me, give me a different uh, uh, amount of flour or of oatmeal, and uh, they're not going to do it until he starts screaming up and down the street, don't ever patronize this guy again. He puts, uh, he, he puts bad stuff in the oatmeal. Um, that's about self-help and self-responsibility. I really believe we don't use those values anywhere near as much as we could or should. Self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equity, equality, and solidarity. I mean, my goodness, from, a, from my own country's point of view, that's the founding fathers speaking. That's, that's the whole history of the democratic movement within the United States. And so if we begin to really believe those values can be lived by any human being who wishes to find a way out of the distrust of the institutions that he or she is currently served by, co-ops are your answer. So my main points here are that we can be intrinsically motivated as employees. We can be intrinsically motivated as, as directors uh, governing the institutions. And we can do that in part because the principles themselves create that sense of, of optimal motivation, and that we have an opportunity to raise a banner that nobody else can. I don't believe any for-profit corporation can claim those values. They can claim the values of ethics and honesty and openness, right? We get a lot of that. We're as transparent as anybody would be. We operate ethically. Enron Corporation had an ethics and values manual that was something like 100 pages long. You can buy it on eBay today 
for a couple of bucks. Uh, that, that didn't help. But I will admit, any corporation can take on those ethical principles and values as, as theirs. They cannot take on the basic values of self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equity, equality, and solidarity. Those don't fit. They fit us, and they don't fit anyone else. So for us to be able to talk about those values as uniquely representing who we are and why members of the cooperative can gain value from that is, I think, the way to go. I started with music. I'm going to end with music. Um, I, I learned very recently this year through some conversations with folks that are in the marketing and branding area of a very interesting way to think about what I heard at Manchester Cathedral, for example, with that chorale, or, or what the Beatles were capable of doing in terms of, of those voices coming together. And I call it instructions for successful bands. And it's five rules, and I think these rules absolutely apply to cooperatives as well. Number one, know the lyrics. That's, that's really important if you're going to be a lead vocalist. Know the lyrics. Number two, listen to one another. Number three, when it's your turn, step up. Nobody else is going to do it for you. When it's your turn, step up. Number four, practice and respect the power of harmony. And number five, have a good song to sing. We have that good song to sing. There's no question about it. So if you go back through and think about it, do we know the lyrics? That's a pretty universal question. And for every employee, for every manager, for every director of every cooperative, regardless of sector or country, do we know the lyrics? Secondly, do we listen to one another? That's very much the cooperation among cooperatives issue. Do we listen to one another? When it's our turn, do we step up, advocate, defend, protect the model, argue for it, make sense of it, not let the detractors say it's an obsolete model, it's irrelevant, it's 1844. When it's our turn, do we step up? And number four, do we respect and practice the power of harmony? And we know we have the good song. So keeping those five instructions for bands or maybe five instructions for successful co-ops, I'll leave you with one particular point that I really uh, took to heart when I first heard it. And that is don't let a day go by when the gap between you and your dreams expands. Thanks very much.